Good afternoon. Welcome to another program of the Associated Student Speakers Program. My name is Diane Gordon. Our guest today um, has done so many things, it would probably take up more of the program to tell you what he's done, so maybe I'll just let him do it himself. Um, we are familiar with him mainly as an actor, but his work has branched out internationally, not only in the U.S. He is the only actor to ever win two Best Actor Awards for the China Syndrome and Missing at the Cannes Film Festival. He, um, he is now up for his eighth Academy Award nomination, as, and he is nominated this time as Best Actor in his role in Costa Gavras' Missing, which you will see a clip from in a moment. Um, since, since 1979, he has won British, German, and Canadian Oscars, as well as the first ever Career Achievement Award from the National Council of Churches and a tribute from Variety Clubs International. He is a Harvard graduate. He was the president of the renowned Hasty Pudding Club. He went to Phillips Academy at Andover. Um, he was a cross-country runner when he was young. He plays the piano by ear, and he, loves, he, he has written some music, especially for the movie Tribute. He plays golf, he plays pool, he likes football, he likes photography, he likes fly fishing, and he likes gardening. And one of his biggest concerns is pollution, air, nuclear, any kind. He started in radio soap operas, worked in television, over 500 performances, and then he went to films. He had all the bad non-paying jobs as a struggling actor, and we'll let him tell you about that. Made his Broadway debut in 1953 in Room Service, and then he was summoned to Columbia Pictures to do film work. He starred in two Judy Holiday films to start his career, and he won his first Oscar for Best Supporting Actor after only five pictures for his role as Ensign Pulver in John Ford's Mr. Roberts. Um, he, worked, he kept working in theater as well, and in 1978, Tribute turned out to be a real charm, a success on Broadway, both artistically and financially, and it was, of course, later made into a film version. He's won an Emmy. <laughs> He's won an Emmy, and, um, well, gee, <laughs> he directed Walter Matthau also in Koch, and Walter Matthau got an Oscar nomination, so when, when can the Oscars keep away from this man? Jack Euler Lemon was born February 8th in Boston, Massachusetts, and he'll be out here in just a few moments, so save your applause. But first, we're going to show you a clip from his Oscar-nominated performance in Missing, and if the projectionist can see me waving... We're going to start that, <laughs> and uh, Jack Lemon will be out in just a few minutes. Thank you. I'm delighted. I just, in case you didn't know, I wanted to remind you, this will only be a question and answer. The last time I actually tried to speak to anybody was at the Sunshine School to my son's graduating class. They were about seven years old. The entire student body got up and walked out. I have not spoken to anybody ever since. Only question and answer. So also, if I'm not too sharp, I've been up all night and I'm still in the same clothes. In the middle of the rainstorm, my house burned down. Only to me. I think it's out of an old movie or something. But at 3.30 this morning, I had to roar out to the beach, and I haven't been to bed yet. However, we shall, we shall carry on, but I'm going to sit, if that's okay. And I think this mic's on both sides, so if anybody's got a question, I know everything. <laughs> Flat out. I really do. So if anybody wants to ask something and kick it off, fire away. Got to take her. Is this all right? Am I? Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. I was curious. Uh, I read that uh, the day, the final shooting day of Buddy Buddy, the very next day out, you were on a plane to Mexico to film Missing. Do you find that hard, uh, difficult to switch into a character just like that, that quick? I was terribly lucky. Uh, and that's a very good point to bring up because very often I found one of the frustrations of film as averse to stage, and I was totally stage trained uh, before film, was a lack of rehearsal time. In other words, it takes you a long time, usually, to kind of find the character. And then suddenly, maybe if you're lucky, the bulb goes off about the second week in rehearsals, let's say. And in a play, usually you rehearse three weeks and then you're on your feet. But uh, in, in film, you don't have that. And very often, 
uh, if you have the luxury, you'll reshoot a lot of the early scenes. Billy Wilder reshoots very often the first couple of weeks of filming, even though he's the writer, let's say, and the director, even when he's on his stick, or like a Some Like It Hot or Apartment, or ones that really worked. Nevertheless, it takes you a while before you can find the character. And I had no time in missing, and I was lucky. It fell in right away. I think it's that in the combination of Costa Gavras being really an absolutely incredible director. I think he's one of the, maybe the finest director with all the good fortune I've had that I've ever worked with. But it fell in. And the hat did a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the actors really are, are like uh, little children in a way. It's, it's amazing what little things can suddenly really pull everything else into focus about a character. And for some reason, instinctively, I wanted him to wear a hat and I wore it, just a, a little simple Brooks Brothers hat, you know, narrow-brimmed and so forth, but it had to sit, not at an angle at all, just flat on, and it kind of put a lid on him and helped me keep him in a straitjacket, in a way. I wanted to, to make him as simple as possible uh, so that in the emotional scenes, when he really finally would let go, then they would really mean something. But in other words, not to use my hands or my face and so forth as much as I usually do. And the hat did it. But it, it, that and Costa and my instincts, which fortunately worked, uh, I was able to fall right into it in a way much earlier than I normally would, or I would have been in real trouble. I really would have it's an without, without that time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There's another mic over there, I think, if anybody wants one. I, Mr. Lemon, I have a yeah. question about your golf game. Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a rotten day. The house went, everything. Go ahead. Well, I, I watched you play a, a pretty interesting roundup at the Crosby. And we <laughs> share the same kind of golf game, but you stay really calm, and I throw clubs. I mean, how, how do you keep such a good attitude about your game? I am so used to missing the golf ball that there is, there's no disgust left in me. <laughs> I mean, I can no longer flagellate myself and beat myself to death mentally. Uh, they also follow me around. I'm used to it. They... they They'll follow me around, and even though they say it's live, it's not really. They're all about 20 seconds later. Mm -hmm. And they'll follow me from the 14th hole on, and they, no matter how many good shots I hit, they wait until I miss, and then bang, that's the one that they put on. Because everybody's waiting for it, <laughs> you know, and I know I'm going to do it. And that's why they do it. Actually, I'm not that bad. You okay. only see the bad ones. Okay. Thanks. So. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. What is yes, your sir. opinion as an actor of the method of acting introduced by Lee Strasberg? And uh, I'd like to know if you follow any method by yourself in finding a part, every time you work on a part, what it, kind of, how do you prepare for it? In other words, am I a method actor? Yeah. Well, yes, I am. Uh, I think when you say method, you know, it's very difficult to really define what that is. I think that really any trained actor, in a sense, is a method actor. Anybody, an actor who really prepares before he goes on stage, or uh, even if it just takes him 20 seconds, he's got to, to get into it, you know. You don't uh, turn and say, fine, listen, I'll see you in just one second. Mildred died. You know, you don't do that. You think for 30 seconds at least about the shock of, and what it is, and, then, and, and as that character of uh, saying Mildred died or whatever. Um, yeah, I am a method actor, and uh, I did not study uh, with Strasberg uh, because there was a guy named David Alexander who, as a matter of fact, now teaches out here uh, that I worked with, uh, and it was the same thing, really. It was a scene study class, basically, um, and it was after I had already uh, been working as a professional actor. But uh, I think that, that most actors, especially if they were stage trained, I would have to say that almost 100% they, they would have to say they are a method actor. But each actor has his own way of preparing and finding a part and approaching parts. That I don't know how to define. Yet each actor has his own way. I don't even know how to explain how I do it. Because sometimes you work from the inside out. Other times you work, you create a shell and crawl into it very often. But usually those are parts where... Uh, Olivier very often works that way. He really does work externally. He, he is first concerned with the look and the walk and the costume and the makeup of this and that very often. And then he kind of crawls inside, finds the character that will make that image work. 
That's one way of doing it if it happens to work. Usually I work from the inside out, a la missing. But for instance, in Some Like It Hot, it was definitely totally the other way. I spent a week doing the makeup and the hair and everything to get what I wanted and doing the lips in a certain way so that when it smiled, it created a certain thing. Then I found the character that would cause that effect that I wanted, actually. But it's all method, in a sense. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about the making of Missing? And uh, I think the film was such a great film. Thank you. And uh, what it was like working with Costa Garbos, what made him so great. And I have an ancillary question, too. Do you plan to make any more films of heavy political content? If, if one were to happen, yes. Uh, but I would not do a film because it had a political statement that I happen to agree with. Uh, in other words, in, it was coincidence that China Syndrome and Missing were just a couple of years apart. Pardon me. Flames. Um, I, I, in other words, I accepted the parts because I, the actor, uh, wanted to play them and to work with those particular people that I was working with, Jim Bridges in this, uh, as writer-director on uh, China Syndrome, because ever since Paper Chase, I just admired him immensely and was waiting and hoping that someday I'd work with him, and it was everything I hoped it would be. And the same with Costa. Uh, I think he, is, he goes beyond being a great director. I think he's one of the handful of, of great filmmakers. In other words, he cannot just direct a good scene. He, he can make a film, top to bottom, and uh, make it work. Billy Wilder on his stick when he's at his best, same thing, has done some truly great films. Um, if one were to happen, as I said, uh, I would do it. Working with Costa, I, I, the best way to describe the kind of leadership that I think a director needs, he's, he's like the captain of the ship, you know, or a general or something that you would follow into battle no matter what. Uh, I had only met him briefly prior to our association on Missing, and then after uh, he fortunately uh, considered me for the part. They sent the script. I loved the script. And Costa came up to my house. And for the first time, we sat down. And I talked to him. And we were sitting at the bar having a glass of wine. And about 30 minutes after he started talking to me, I realized my house is on a kind of, kind of a big, a, a small cliff. But it's about a 70-foot drop straight off at the end of the property. And I realized after about a half an hour, if he said, Jack, would you please just walk out to the edge of the cliff and jump? I would have said, yes, I'll do it. That's, that's the main quality. Uh, I had no fear, in other words, or trepidation of any direction that he would give me. And that doesn't always happen. You don't always trust your director. Uh, no matter what he would suggest, I, I was enthusiastic about it because I, I trusted him. I trusted his taste and his dramatic sense. He has a marvelous sense of drama, of where to go in a scene and find that one moment that it will build to and that will go bow, you know. And uh, that's why the picture worked. Um, also, he has an incredible enthusiasm, as you would guess from that kind of man, that is very infectious. I mean, the whole set is walking on ping pong balls. You, you're a foot off the air. You just, you want to go and go and go. We'd go 10 hours or 11 hours and somehow you're not tired until afterwards. And then when they'd, they'd say, okay, it's a wrap, then you'd realize you're exhausted but he could keep you going. Those were, those were the main qualities. Mark Costa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lemon, of all the yeah. famous, talented co-stars you've worked with over the years, uh, Tony Curtis, uh, Sissy Spacek, Walter Matthau, uh, do you have a favorite of all of those that... My favorite with? leading lady is Walter Matthau. Yeah. <laughs> There's no question about that. No, I really don't. And, and the reason being, it's like I don't, uh, I did say I think that Costa certainly as good and maybe the best director. But uh, God, you know, like with directors to digress for a second, I'm including George Cukor and John Ford and, and, and so many really marvelous ones. And the same is with actors and actresses. I have been awfully fortunate. I've never worked with one that I didn't really get along with uh, or didn't respect. Some more than others, but uh, for instance, in Leading Ladies, it, I started out with Judy Holliday, and I don't think that there is a better actress. She was absolutely marvelous. But uh, so is Jane, in my, my opinion, Fonda, and, and uh, Annie Bancroft, and oh my God, he goes on and on. I don't really have a favorite. Uh, I think with actors, my, I do have a favorite, and that is Walter. 
actually. But there's, it goes beyond just my professional esteem of him. He's, he's about my closest friend. So I'm sure that, sure that uh, affects it, you know. And we get along so well, and it's, it's just a joy. It doesn't work. It's like uh, doing a scene with him is like, you know, coming down to breakfast and talking across the table or something. It's just, uh, it's like silk. You know? Mr. Lemon, yes, what kind of trouble did Missing run into with the U.S. government? I'm sorry, love, I couldn't quite What answer. kind of trouble did Missing run into with the U.S. government? Oh, with the government? A lot. Thank God. Do you know much no, about No, what happened? Well, it was really, it was kind of fascinating, and, uh, and it thrilled me. Uh, uh, because it came from a book. It was a small, uh, almost like a novelette, really, of the true story from Ed Horman's point of view of what happened in uh, the Chilean uprising uh, when his son was missing and eventually found dead, that he was murdered. Um, when the novel came out, it was written by a guy named Thomas Hauser, who was then a reporter on the New, on the New York Times, I think. Um, the State Department didn't say boo. Now, we have always had, uh, the official government stand is that we had nothing whatsoever to do with the Chilean uprising. Well, that's not true. But once they had taken that stand, they have never backed down from it and admitted that they were lying or anything. But it's exactly the same as El Salvador today, precisely, except we admit that we are involved in El Salvador, that we are backing it, that we have military advisors and billions of dollars and all of that. We did the same thing in Chile but wouldn't admit it. When the book came out and flat out said, as the picture does, that we were involved, the State Department didn't say boo for the simple reason that the book was not a big seller. It wasn't a bestseller. When the picture came out, fortunately, it was a hit right away. It opened in five major cities and busted the house records in either three or four of them. Uh, the State Department then, within a week after it opened, figured they had a hot potato, so they came out with, for the first time in history with a denunciation of a film. And they really just said, this is lies, and it's not true, and blah, blah, blah. Well, all that did was bring more attention to the film. And uh, we were all thrilled for the simple reason that they would not have done it if the film was not powerful. You know, it was a, an affirmation, really, of what we hoped and felt. Uh, then, later, uh, Ambassador Davis, the former ambassador to Chile at that time, Davis, uh, threatened a lawsuit for a couple of million dollars. Universal begged him to please initiate the lawsuit, but he wouldn't do it. <laughs> then, just as we were up for nominations for the Academy, he comes out with a $160 million lawsuit, and we're still begging him, and it, he hasn't done it yet. I don't think it will ever go to court, frankly, because I think too many... Uh, papers that are now classified as secret of state, secrets of state concerning uh, uh, young Horman's death would have to surface. Many of them have, but many of them have not. The State Department will not divulge others, and I think they would have to in order to uh, initiate uh, the lawsuit, and I don't think they want to do that. Were you able to meet Ed Horman? Yes, I'm a very good friend of his now. Wonderful, delightful man. Marvelous man, the whole family, as a matter of fact. And it was kind of fascinating, but I, thank God, did not meet him until the very end of the film. So I was not influenced by the real Ed Horman in my interpretation of Ed Horman. And I didn't want to be, because I think it would be limiting rather than an aid. In other words, if he was famous and people had an image of him, okay, then I would want to know him. In other words, if you're playing MacArthur, you've got to do mannerisms that look like him, etc., or some other famous person. But since nobody really knows Ed Horman, I was free to approach him as I would any other character, you know, as far as my interpretation of Ed Horman, as long as I had basically the, the character that was there on the pages. Uh, Mr. Lemon, uh, with whom... I'm here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, with whom didn't you like working and why in your career? Was there anybody you didn't like working with? That I didn't like? Yes. No, not really. Um, or nobody that you would know. In other words, as far as uh, playing opposite people in major parts, no. Thank God. That can happen and it's awful tough. It's not that they're not a nice person or this and that or that they're temperamental. Just sometimes you don't hit it off or maybe you don't respect each other as an actor, and then it is, it's awfully tough to work. You know, then you're really acting. Uh, 
you've got to do it. It's like beating a dead horse. Or it's, it's, it's really comparable to, which I have been through and haven't we all, to, let's say, doing a play. And you have an advanced sale, so it's going to run, let's say, for a couple of months anyhow. And you open, and it's a total bomb. It really stinks. And the critics hate it and so forth. Audiences are cold. And now you have to keep doing it. Performance after performance. Oh, my God. Uh, it's awful tough. It's the same thing if you have to work with somebody that you don't like. Uh, it's only happened to me a few times, and they were smaller parts where we didn't have to, have, you know, have to work too long together. And like, uh, what do you do besides acting? I, I faint a lot, and uh, I, you, most of the time I'm looking for work, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I've enjoyed, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more used to the long waits in between. Uh, when you hit a certain level, if you're fortunate, um, it's, well, it's a phrase I've used in the past, but success breeds unemployment. In other words, if you're fortunate enough to get films like A Missing or A China Syndrome, marvelous parts, then you try of course, to keep that level of, of work up, you know, that standard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which means that although you may be getting a lot of scripts, you don't want to do them because they're not of that caliber, let's say. And I don't want to work for the sake of working. I want to work only when I'm excited and I really feel that it's something worthwhile. So you have those long waits in between that used to drive me crazy. It's like telling an athlete he can't go to the gym to work out but show up for the meet, you know. Uh, I travel a great deal and... Uh, I've always loved music, and I write songs for my own amazement and amusement. Uh, so I spent a lot of time at, at the, uh, the piano. I travel a lot, as I said, and uh, golf a lot. I took golf up really when I, when I was in my mid-30s, I think out of a need to fill that time. And it's been a source of great enjoyment, including those rotten shots. Uh, and uh, I love to fish. I go to Alaska at least once every year, sometimes twice, uh, with my son and go fishing for two, three weeks. That's about it. Pretty mundane. Mr. Lemon, we've seen you in a great variance of roles, and I'm wondering which is your favorite method, the comedic way of presenting a role in order to convey your message or the more yeah. dramatic as in this? Good question. I don't really have a favorite of comedy or drama. In other words, I don't prefer dramatic parts as averse to comedic parts. It's just the part itself that may grab me. The only time I've really looked for one or the other is if I've done, let's say, two or three in a row and they were comedies, or two and three in a row and they were dramas. Then for a change of pace, I might uh, hope to find uh, another, you know, a different kind of role to attract me. The one that does get my attention, most of all, is the combination, which is very rare, very hard to find. I've been very lucky. Um, tribute was one, not the film, I was disappointed in the film, but the stage, the, the uh, stage play worked very well, infinitely better than the film. But even though it's about a man dying of cancer, there was a hell of a lot of comedy in it. Those are the marvelous parts, if you can find them. The Apartment is a good example. I don't know whether to call that a comedy, as some people did, or a drama. It was a drama, but it had a hell of a lot of comedy in it. Those are the ideal ones. You know. But other than that, I don't really have a preference. In fact, do you have a favorite role or a role that you oh. feel you left more of a mark on? I think if, if I did have one, and again, it's only because I've been so fortunate over the years uh, and been able to play both comedy and drama, it's impossible to compare them. You know, you can't compare an Ensign Pulver, let's say, with a Wine and Roses, you know, or uh, the Odd Couple with, say, The Tiger or Missing or China Central or whatever. Uh, if I had a favorite one, I would probably tend to say missing, and that may be because that was the last one. So emotionally, that's kind of supplants, you know, it's the most recent one that was a joyous experience in, in my mind. But I don't really have a favorite. Hello? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. You, have a, uh, you betray a lot of different personalities. How many personalities do you have, really? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've even got one. <laughs> Uh, well, do you just use different versions of the same personality, or what? The, well, no, I, don't, I think just as an actor, you know, you just you try to get into that character, that's all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, or maybe I should say, let the character get into you. That's, that's a more proper way of saying it, because you can't let the character take over. That's very dangerous, if the character actually takes over. But you try to get as much of it as you can inside of you and let it come out of you and just be that personality, but uh, uh, I guess like a businessman, you try to just close the door. It's not really you at all. 
you don't have to be anywhere near that uh, a personality in order to portray him well, as long as you can understand him, you know. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to like him. I played some marvelous parts that I loved playing, but I didn't like the character. I did not like the character in, say, The Tiger, for instance, but I loved playing him. But I did not really respect him. I felt sorry for him because of the choices he made and the situation he had put himself in by the misuse, let's say, of the American dream, where the economics became his whole life. You know, and so he'd burn his factory down in order to stay in business. I wish somebody had burned the rest of my house down. I could replace it. But anyway, uh, it, it, it really has nothing to do with the fact that I played many different characters or personalities uh, with my personality. In other words, I don't have to have any part of their personalities. What I hope to have is, is only the ability to play another personality, really. What advice would you give to new actors that's coming out today? Stay right here. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. Okay. The only place now that you can get really good experience is in a college or a university. In other words, the opportunities, thank God, that I had are no longer there. I, I was the most fortunate thing with all the good luck that I've had, I think, was being born at the time that I was born. Because I was able to get a college education, thank God, because I think that's very important. Um, more important than, let's say, just studying acting, even though you know you want to be an actor. I think getting a good education is, is absolutely vital. Uh, but after that education, when I came down to New York, then television was just beginning to burgeon. It was wide open, and it was just, you know, flying. And, and there were no stars. So parts, once you got your foot in the door and got a couple of parts, then, my God, you could get a, you know, a 500-line part or a five-line part. And I did four or 500 shows before I ever uh, did a film. And I didn't realize at that time that that was just invaluable experience. It was like instant stock, you know. And a lot of the shows were, were very well directed and very well written. You know, guys like uh, Sid Lamette and Johnny Frankenheimer and writers like Patty Chayefsky and Rod Serling and Rose and, oh, God, it, it, marvelous young writers. So some of it was really good. And you got great experience. But that's now, you know, trying to get a part on television now, that's a big deal. It wasn't then. Even summer stock, which I could get then. Now it's, it's always stars and names and everything. It's just very tough to get the experience. And you get it in the universities and colleges. And I'm stunned at uh, when I work with young people that, that, you know, have come out of UCLA, let's say, or USC or whatever, and other fine schools, at how good they are as writers, directors, and actors, and how, how fast they have learned. And obviously this is where they got it. And I would advise any young actor to, to do that rather than go out and try to get professional work as averse to going to college and studying. Mr. Lemon, um, yes, how did you feel about your son Chris going into um, show business? And did it affect your relationship? I'm sorry, love, I couldn't under quite understand you. Uh, how did you feel about your son going into uh, show business? Into what? Show business. Oh, show business. I'm sorry. Oh, that. <laughs> I loved it, but I never pushed him whatsoever. I never would. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I was a little surprised because he's now, he just turned 28, and he is acting. He's doing Barefoot in the Park, as a matter of fact, in La Mirada or something. Um, he's damn good, too. Uh, he really is. Uh, he was primarily interested in music. He started composing when he was four or five years old. And uh, I was delighted, and he went to Cal Art School of Music because that's what he was primarily interested in. And then when he was about 20, he started to also drift into acting and fell in love with that too. So I'm, I'm just delighted, you know. I, I hope that he makes it. I think primarily I'm delighted because he loves it. That's the most important thing. And number two, I, quite frankly, I think he's good. I think he has talent, and I think he has a damn good chance of making a good living at it. And uh, he's a damn sight better looking than I am. I know that. And uh, he's, he's really doing well, so I'm very pleased. But I never pushed him. I wouldn't do that. Thank you. No. Hi. Hi. Um, what did it take <coughs> for you to, to portray the role of a woman in Some Like It Hot? And um, what was it like working with uh, Marilyn Monroe? I loved working with her. Tony did not because she was chronically late. I mean, stories that you hear about her are true, but I thought she was kind of fascinating, the whole mystique of Marilyn was there, as far as I was concerned. Uh, in playing the role, there was only one thing I really had in my mind. I mentioned earlier in how I arrived at a character, and that was to never, ever 
worry about the fact that I was in drag or to ever allow myself to be inhibited. I think that if you're going to play a part like that and you ever have the slightest fear of anybody thinking that uh, you're gay or anything else or whatever, you're dead. I don't think you can give a good performance. I think you have to go all the way, just let it go and don't even think about it. You might as well be pairing, wearing a pair of blue jeans, you know, as far as that goes. Uh, that's the only thing uh, that I felt. And I also felt, don't ever think, as a verse to uh, 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 most parts. It's one of the few times where I feel that a character never, ever even stops to think or really listen to the other people. He goes against all the rules of acting. But in other words, instead of acting, he only reacted. He immediately said whatever came into his mind without even thinking. Allah, for instance, uh, uh, when he, in one scene, just, I, I do this only to, to make the point, I've forgotten the exact lines, but at one point, he, they think, he and, uh, uh, he, me and Tony and I think that we're going to be shot by gangsters, and we're throwing stuff into a suitcase, and we're in the, in drag, and so forth, and without even thinking, I say, I tell you, honest to God, if they come in here and go, like that and so forth and I'm shot looking like this and they bring me to the morgue and I'm dressed up like this I'm gonna die of embarrassment you know he just doesn't even think it was something like that I don't know but it, it, it's an example of what I mean so I just didn't even think about it I just let it go all the way to the moon thanks you're welcome um, mr. lemon do you feel that uh, as far as not just being uh, making a living in acting but being successful and establishing a name and, and becoming a leading man do you feel that it's uh, some of the key factors to, the, to, to that are uh, being creative and unique to your kind before anyone before you or being at the right place at the right time or just working at it? What, is, what are some of the key factors offhand that you can think of for, for establishing a name and uh, being successful, not just yeah. uh, earning a living? I think that there's good fortune involved. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much talent an, an actor has. It, 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 Somewhere along the line, and more than once, you've got to be the right guy at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. to pop into somebody's mind, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, then as things go on, I think an awful lot of it is selection, really. Um, with no names mentioned uh, over the years, because, damn, I'm a middle-aged dinosaur at this point. I've been around a long time. And I have seen a lot of very good careers ruined because the actor suddenly becoming famous, let's say, or whatever, and commanding a lot of money, starts doing pictures for the deal, as averse to the content, or doing a picture because he thought it would be a box office smash. I've never done that. Um, and I think it's one of the main reasons I'm still around, honest to God. Because you do a few like that, and then all of a sudden it's whatever became of Georgie Kunfarts. You know, he's gone. Mm -hmm. Or he's off doing orders in Europe or something. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful. And do a, you have to selfishly sort of, or egotistically, I think, do a film or a play or whatever you're doing for yourself. The hell with the audience that you basically are working for. In the sense that you do it because you believe in it. And you believe that it's worthwhile. Then you just pray to God that enough other people agree with you. It's that simple. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But I think if you really keep at that, and don't get seduced into doing things, you know, for the sake of working or for the sake of the deal, uh, that you'll, you will last a lot longer. I really do. It's, in other words, it's better to stay unemployed until the right thing happens. Yeah. When you get to the point, the luxury of being able to do that. But even before that, I think it's selection. Mm -hmm. I really do. And also, um, you have a great versatility for switching from, from a, a funny role to a, a very dramatic role. Some actors, uh, leading men, have fallen into a, a serious genre or, or a very funny yeah. genre. And it's like, uh, I've, I see some funny actors in, uh, who are very humorous and very good at being humorous, but when they try to portray a serious role, people can't relate to it. How did, what do you feel uh, helps an actor to, to be versatile enough so that people can relate and believe to him in both types of characters? Well, it's first is the ability to do both. Mm -hmm. um, usually, I find that uh, a good actor in comedy, let's say, a good comedic actor, can play drama easier than a good dramatic actor can play comedy. Mm -hmm. Comedy is tougher. Mm -hmm. It's tougher to write, it's tougher to direct, it's tough, definitely tougher to act successfully mm -hmm. in general. Um, and I'm not really positive why, except I think it's the onus that's placed on it where it's just got to be funny. And if it isn't funny, then it's awful. 
you know. There's nothing worse than knowing something that should have worked and it didn't, and it takes you 10 minutes to get the audience back. Whereas if a dramatic scene just holds your attention, then at least they'll stay, you know, and they're with it. Um, it the ability to do both and then fight the system so that you can get both. Because uh, in all of our, in the theater and in films, we tend to want to pigeonhole people. We know we want to put a label on them and say, this is a, uh, I don't know, a Paul Newman role. This is a Jack Lemmon role, whatever. And the, the problem is not to be able to do that. And it's not easy. It took me two years. It, the breakthrough for me was way, way back with the Days of Wine and Roses about 20 years ago. But it took me a year and a half to get that film done. Nobody would do it with me in it. And uh, Save the Tiger was two years. It, what there, it was because they really didn't think that there would be enough appeal and that the young people wouldn't, wouldn't be attracted to the film, younger, the younger audience. But it is not easy. It's okay. Now I get both offered all the time, but it, it was very difficult uh, at first. You have to fight to do it, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Thank you Again, selectivity. Yeah. Good afternoon, Jack. Over here. I haven't even uh, said hello yet. Are you kidding? <laughs> Pardon me. I, uh, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I've been a member of um, Alcoholics Anonymous now for a few years. And your movie, Days in Wine, of Wine and Roses, is often mentioned at meetings, um, particularly the scene in the, um, in the greenhouse where you're trying to find a bottle. Now, that illustrates better than anything that I've heard so far about you switching from the comedy to the dramatic. What I wanted to ask was, um, did you do a lot of research before the, the role? Did you go to meetings, etc.? Yes, um, both Lee Remick and I did. Uh, it's some parts you don't have to research, some it's very valuable. I found that absolutely invaluable because I knew uh, uh, some alcoholics and, uh, uh, and I knew about AA, but I didn't realize how naive I was about it. So I went to a number of meetings myself. For some peculiar reason, they welcomed me with open arms immediately. But, uh, and I really found them inspiring. Honestly, I, I, my admiration was just, wow. And also, Lee and I spent uh, some unfortunate nights in the drunk tanks in the old Lincoln Heights jail and other places so that we really knew what it was like to go through that terrible degradation and total loss of dignity you know, of what a poor son of a bitch goes through if he reaches that point. And it was absolutely invaluable. Yeah, we did a lot of research. Ever been to Scotland? Yes. I have about two dozen golf balls that are still over there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I love it. Mr. Lemon, over here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that you enjoy fishing with your son. Mm -hmm. My question is, in the filming of Tribute, did you ever develop a relationship with Robbie Benson oh, yeah. that was similar to that which you have with your son? And if so, did that aid you in developing your character? Yeah, I think the fact that I... Uh, it's interesting, in both Tribute and in Missing, I think the fact that I have my son Chris was... That, that's like research, in a way. It was absolutely invaluable. And fortunately, I, have a, I adore that boy, and we have a great relationship. So I knew what the pain would be, first if he was missing and in tribute if they were pop miles apart, you know, and couldn't seem to contact each other. And I did, both with Bobby Picardo, who played it on the stage, and with Robbie Benson, I became very, very close. Yeah, it would be almost impossible not to, or it would be a shame if one were to do either of those films and not get close, you know, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the other character as the son. I became very close. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Lemon, I have a question regarding your future as an actor. Are there any characters you would like to play? Or are there any directors or actors, actresses you would like to play with? There's a lot, really. It would, uh, I wouldn't even want to start trying to name them. There really is. There's a lot of actors and actresses and directors that I hope someday to work with. There's so many uh, marvelous talents that I have yet to work with, with all my good fortune that I would like to. Uh, there are no specific parts that, uh, when I was younger, I guess like all actors, you know, I'd, I'd never really wanted to play Hamlet, but I always, I wanted to play Iago, who doesn't? I think every actor wants to be a real villain. And uh, I always wanted to do Playboy of the Western World. I, someday, maybe I could still do that. I'd, I'd like to do Cyrano. 
Um, but there are no specific ones, but I think it's because I've been so lucky and had so many good parts. That's why there isn't a, a, a specific one. The next thing I'm going to do, well, I hope to do a, a film this summer of a play uh, called Mass Appeal, about a middle-aged priest and a younger priest. And then I'm doing a play uh, uh, by the author of Vaughn Golden Pond next uh, fall. I'm going to do it here and then San Francisco and then Broadway. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That just about concludes our show, and I know that we're sorry to say goodbye, but thank you all so much for coming, and why don't you give Mr. Levin a big hand. Thanks so much. Thank you.